Well, I'd like to welcome you to our discussion today. There are a lot of other things you could be doing on Sunday afternoon, like even taking a nap. So I'm thankful that you're here. These lessons are some special lessons that the elders have planned. As a rule, we've been doing them once a month on some key topics that we believe are essential for leaders for the next generation. So we have some men among us who are being trained and mentored for leadership in the future. And we're just thankful that you've chosen to join us today. I want to begin first by expressing my support for these fine lessons we've had on assembly. What a nice lesson we had today on prayer, uh, last week, this week on giving. We've just had some superior lessons on the assembly. My goal is to not to replicate what these fine brothers have shared with you, but to perhaps offer some new information. Our topic today is that the assembly is God's wonderful gift. We're going to deal with some false concepts that maybe surround the idea of assembly. We're going to talk about what it means to be in church. We're going to talk about the assembly as the most regulated activity that we as Christians participate in. And we're going to talk about the two instructions that God has given only to men. I don't know what comes to mind when you envision the early church. Maybe they met in a catacomb. Maybe it met in a home, as we see biblically, where a lot of congregations met in homes. But it's in this structure that God has a lot to say about the assembly. My interest in the assembly goes back quite a ways. Actually, uh, is Al still among us? There he is right there. Al, do you remember many years ago, there was a discussion in the eldership. One brother had presented some ideas about assembly, and his comment was, we really don't know much about the assembly. So Al and I were tasked as young elders to study a little bit on that subject. And I've been fascinated about the assembly probably for about 20 years. So I want to share some thoughts with you about the New Testament assembly. The first thing that I would like to discuss with you is to dispel some false concepts as to what the assembly is. The first that you often hear is a worship service. Have you ever heard that word service used around here? Well, everything we do as Christians is a service. In Romans 12, 1, he says, I urge you, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. The King James, unfortunately, travel, uh, translates that worship. So there have been some thoughts in the last 10 years or so that maybe everything we do is worship. But there is a word for worship, which is proskuneo, but the word here is latreian, which is the root word being latruo, which means service. So everything we do, giving our bodies a living sacrifice, is our spiritual service unto God. However, the assembly is never called a service. The word service implies that somehow there's a duty being fulfilled. And historically, in the denominational world, you find that there was meritorious uh, connection with going to church, the service. It's where you went for service. And very much akin to an, the idea of a sacrament, you did something and thereby somehow had meritorious benefit. What if this is not a time of service? Since the Bible never uses that word, what if this is a time 
where God edifies us? What if this is a time where God encourages us? What if this is a time where we remember the wonderful things that Jesus has done? What if this is a time of instruction? What if this is a time of loving? What if this is a time where we come together in the loving fellowship of God's family? What if we could transition from the idea that church or going to church is a duty or a service? What if we could transition to the idea it's a blessing and a gift from God? You're invited to the table of the Lord. You're children of the King. This is your loving family. What if we transition from service to privilege? This is something God designed for our wonderful welfare. Most of us invited to a birthday party, we don't say birthday service. We call it a birthday party. It's something we look forward to going to. Now, there have been some birthday parties I've not looked forward to. I understand that. But as a rule, this is something wonderful that we would look forward to. The second is, tied with this, that somehow the assembly is a meritorious duty. Somehow in doing this, you earn brownie points. I don't know that that is ever taught in the scripture. It's a time where God wants to bless you. Another false assumption is that the assembly is all about worship. Well, that's not true either. There are two dimensions going on. There is a vertical direction where we worship God, of course, and we praise and we sing. Have you noticed some of the songs we sing are horizontal? Have you noticed that? Angry words, oh, let them never. I don't think that's a praise song to God, is it? I think that's so we can remember how we ought to talk to one another. So the assembly is not all about God. The assembly is certainly about God, but it's also about us. Isn't that a beautiful concept? The other is that the assembly should be entertaining. And that, of course, ties in with our culture. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will look for teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That sounds like our generation, doesn't it? Now, that doesn't mean that the assembly should be drab. It ought to be uplifting. And our ministers, haven't they done a nice job? The singing this morning, the prayers this morning, the encouragement this morning. It ought to be a wonderful time where we honor God and we're mutually edified. The statement was made back 20 years ago that I referenced that we don't know much about the assembly. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. We actually know more about the assembly than any other regulated topic in the New Testament. That's going to be a surprise to you. The assembly is about five acts of worship. The scripture never talks about an act of worship. That carries with it again that idea of a sacrament, something you do that somehow has meritorious value in God's sight. That doesn't mean we don't sing. It doesn't mean we don't pray. It doesn't mean we don't take the Lord's Supper. It doesn't mean we don't preach. It means it's not an act. Unfortunately, that has crept in probably from denominational background. The other false concept is since we're all equal, we all have the same assembly roles. And that's not true either. We have different roles that God has assigned so one of the things I'd like to accomplish today is to bring about a paradigm shift. I want us to shift from service, the assembly is my service to God, to understanding it's my gift from God. I do come to praise Him, but I also come to be edified. I'm invited to the King's table. I'm invited to be with the Lord's people. It's a family gathering. It's not a duty, it's a high privilege.
to come into the presence of the Lord. The second thing I want to talk about is this idea of being in church. Now we are always the church of Christ, but we're not always the assembled church. Now the Greek word for church, many of you know, is ekklesia. Ek means out, klesia means call. So the church literally is the called out. The called out are often often translated assembly or often just translated church. We are always and at all times the called out of Jesus Christ. But we're not always the assembled or in ecclesia. We're not always the assembled church. The New Testament differentiates between being the church and being the assembled church. And the way that differentiation is made is with the Greek phrase en ecclesia. En ecclesia means in the assembly. And usually it's preferenced by you gather together in assembly. Let me show you some Bible passages. When you come together, the Greek there is en ecclesia, in the church. And it's prefaced with come together. Do you see that? So you have the gathering to be in ecclesia. But in the church, I would rather speak five words with understanding in ecclesia. Now the Apostle Paul is going to say, I can speak in tongues more than all of you. But if I come speaking a foreign language, how does that benefit? Because when you're in ecclesia, all are to be encouraged and all are to be edified. Tongue speakers, consequently, must be silent in the church unless there's a translator. Why? Well, Paul's say, going to say you can speak to God and you can do that privately. But in the church, certain rules and regulations apply. Notice the next passage. As in all the churches... There you have that word, in ecclesia, let the women be silent in the church. You have the in ecclesia two times here. In ecclesia, this is where women are to be silent, as in all the in ecclesias or all the churches. Some have said that the instruction given in Corinthians was because women were disruptive. And that was a very specific situation. But notice... This passage says, as in all the churches of the saints. So this is a broad instruction and legislation for all the churches. Why? He actually is going to tell you it's a disgrace for a woman to speak in ecclesia. I remember a lesson that Charles Spear gave on hermeneutic. And one of the things he said is, when God explains to you why, you might want to pay attention. Whether you agree with his why or not, you might want to pay attention when God tells you why something is so. He tells you here, it's a disgrace. The next one, so I command in all the churches, and you see it is a command in ecclesia. And here's an interesting passage in Colossians. When this letter has been read among you, see that it is read in ecclesia of the Laodiceans. That you read the letter and that you read the letter that I sent to them. Again, in ecclesia. So in the church, they're to read this letter from Paul. And they then are to get the letter that was sent to the other congregation. So the assembly is actually the most regulated activity that we as Christians have. How many instructions do you think there are? Well, to my great amazement as we were doing this study, and there's a handout here and I'd like for everyone to get a copy. And if we don't have enough copies for someone, then we'll be happy to make more. If you leave me your name and your email, I can probably email it to you. This These are the instructions. Two pages. And most of them are found between 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, all the way through chapter 14. 
It is the most highly regulated activity that we participate in. When you look at the context in which these regulations were given, you see that at the Corinthian church, and we're in the study of the Corinthian book, there were terrible abuses taking place in the assembly. And he's going to start out with verse 17. He says, when you all come together in Ecclesia, it is not the Lord's Supper that you take. I just have a hard time imagining what was happening there. Uh, Some people were eating. Some were getting drunk. Some had nothing to eat. There were poor people. Some felt they were center stage. My gift, they were speaking in a tongue that no one could understand. Imagine if we had a foreigner stand up today, right here, and just start speaking a foreign language. And over here, you know, we have uh, Brother Truel, and he's eating a sandwich and getting drunk. I mean, just imagine the chaos that existed in the Corinthian context. People were wanting their ears tickled. People were proud of my knowledge. There were some who said, I'm given a big gift. Look at my contribution. There were some women that were speaking. God's response to this chaos was, your assembly is for the worse. This is not what it should be. He's going to say it's childish. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. But as I grew up, I gave up childish things. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, you're missing the point. He also says, when you take the Lord's Supper, you're eating damnation to yourself. Because they were not discerning what the bread meant and what the juice meant. God's correction in this context is, I want you to wait for one another. I want you to eat at home. This is not about filling your stomach. I want you to use known languages. And furthermore, I only want two or three speakers. It is a command that these tongue speakers, only two or three, and the prophets, only two or three. That's interesting that the Holy Spirit cared about you getting out of the assembly as well. This is not just an eternal free-for-all. The Holy Spirit said no more than two or three tongue speakers. And he's going to say, I want it done orderly. And he tells you why. Because God is a God of order. That's interesting, isn't it? He doesn't want this crazy free-for-all. And he says, I want you to discern the sacrifice. And women in this situation are to be silent. And God clarifies why this is so. It's so that all can be edified, all can be encouraged, all can praise God, all can learn, all can discern the sacrifice, and all can be loved and be loving. Isn't that beautiful? These regulations are not there to hinder us. They're to facilitate this communal experience that we come together in church. Now, we're always a church, but we're not always in church. In church is a decision that we make when we come together as a unified body. We take the Lord's Supper. It happens on the first day of the week. It also ends with a decision. I'll give you a story. When I grew up in Berlin, my father would be looking for places where we could start a church. And often, one of the only halls you could rent was at the local beer hall or the beer stube. Now, put that in the context of like in England, a pub or something like that. It's not just a drinking place. You can also eat there and so on. So when we would gather, we were in Ecclesia. Now, when we made a decision to end that meeting, we were no longer in Ecclesia. And if you stayed around too long, you were in the pub. (laughs) So there is a distinction to be made, and it's made by decision. Isn't this beautiful? Here you have the abuse. Here you have God's response. Here you have God's correction. And he even tells you why. It's so that all of us 
can have the benefit of this loving experience. Isn't this beautiful? And I've said this before, and some of you have heard this discussed. I never realized before this study many years ago that 1 Corinthians 13 was an assembly passage. It certainly is a passage as to how Kathy and I ought to behave and how Bob ought to treat Jan. It is certainly applicable there. But that's not why this passage was written. It was written so we might know how to behave in Ecclesia. And that becomes obvious when you look at the fact that the elements of what they were doing in Ecclesia are going to be mentioned and it's going to be spoken of in hyperbole. For example, he says, if you can speak in tongues, well, what if you could speak like angels? There's hyperbole. He says, what if you can prophesy? What if you have understanding of all these deep mysteries that no one else knows? What if you have knowledge beyond everything? What if you have faith so that you can move mountains? What if you give everything away? There's the giving in the church. We talked about that this morning. What if you gave, there's a hyperbole, your body to be burned? Well, you look at prophesying and faith and understanding and knowledge and contribution. You go, oh, that's wonderful. But here's what God says. If you don't have love, it's all in vain. What makes a church grow when we're together is us loving one another. It's when we're kind to one another. It's when we're patient with one another. It's when we're forbearing with one another. It's when we don't make accusations against one another. Can you imagine coming together in a loving family gathering to praise God with one voice? Isn't that beautiful? I really believe that's what God is intending. So the paradigm shift is from all about me to all about us. And that with one voice we can praise God and all of us can be edified. Now last week, or last month I should say, Tim Burrow who did an excellent job in his lesson, he talked about the Greek imperative an imperative in the Greek is a command. It's hard to translate because our language structure is a little different. The way the translators try to communicate that something is a command or an imperative from the Greek language is often by the word let. Now in our English language, that doesn't quite carry the force of a command. But these lets are all imperatives. Now, a lot of these things that guide the assembly are principles, but there are some very definite commands. It's the most regulated, commanded activity that we do in Christianity. I don't know what kind of water you have to baptize people in. I know people have been baptized in beautiful bath water. I've known people baptized in murky river water. M.P. John wanted to be baptized in the sun gum where the two rivers flow together. He wanted to be baptized right in the middle. I said, brother, we can do that. It's not a problem. We don't know much about who does the baptism. We don't know about what kind of dress you ought to wear. We don't know what needs, you know, how many need to be there. We don't know if it's night or day. We just don't know much about how it is to be done other than it needs to be immersion in water for the remission of sins. Now that's regulated. But look at these regulations. Let, this is about the assembly, all things be done for edification. Let one interpret. It's a command. Let him keep silent in the church. So if there's not an interpreter, it's commanded. Do your thing at home, but in the church you're to be silent. And if you want to speak in a foreign language, speak to yourself and God. It's a command. Let two or three prophets speak. It's a command. And if one receives a revelation, then the other is to be silent. And let this brother speak. Let your women keep silence or silent in ecclesia. 
in the church gathering. Let them ask their husbands at home. Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are command of the Lord. What if you choose to ignore this? And there's quite a discussion about what this means. Most commentators think, let him be ignorant. If you're ignorant, just be ignorant. (laughs) And then let all things be done decently and in order. So when you get this handout, I want you to look at all of the regulations that God has given for the assembled church. There are only two things where God has specifically specified that men are to serve. The first is the eldership. They need to be the husband of one wife. The other is the speaking role in the assembly. Brothers and sisters, there are so many things that women do, have done in the first century. Tim pointed some of those things out. So many things women do, and it's not just fixing meals. Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos. We have the teaching of children. I'm the product of a faithful Bible school teacher who worked with my family, Betty Romer in Berlin. She was the first one who introduced me to all these fine Bible stories and taught me to love the Lord along with my parents. There are so many wonderful things that women can do in the Lord's church. There's only two areas where God has specified, and He tells you why. One is the eldership, and the other is speaking in the assembly. So, a paradigm shift. We're not going to come together to do my own thing. We're going to assemble to do it God's way. And it's highly regulated. Why is it highly regulated? So that all can be edified and it be a loving experience as we praise God with one voice. Here's some concluding admonitions. Please, let's do the assembly God's way. What a high privilege to come together, not as service, but to rejoice as we remember and encourage and praise God. We want to put away these false concepts. We want to maximize our loving relationships. We don't want to be tempted just by the entertainment factor. And we want to keep instructing the basics to each generation. And you know that that's not happening as regularly as it needs to happen. Many of our younger, in the younger generation, really don't understand much about what we have gone through to try to be the church of the New Testament. And we have to keep restoring these essentials in every generation. So those are some thoughts I want to share with you. I hope that they're encouraging to you. And if I said something that you're confused about or don't understand, please talk to me. I'll be happy to see if I can offer some clarification to what I've said. The wonderful assembly of the Lord's body, highly regulated so that all can be blessed. And I hope next Sunday when you get up, you just go, I get to go to church. Not... Now, I would get up sometimes, don't want to go anywhere. I understand that factor. But I get to go to church and to be with God's people. Because this is where God wants to build me up and encourage me and edify me and love me. These are the people who know my name and love me. And we're going to praise God with one voice. Let's say a prayer together. Father, we want to do the assembly your way. Give us wisdom and encouragement. We're thankful that you've planned a time when we come together, Father, as the assembled, called out of your people. And we want to praise you, Father, but we also want to understand the wonderful gift it is to us, the high privilege to sit at your table and to remember the wonderful sacrifice that sets us free from sin. Give us wisdom every day. We pray for this next generation that some of these concepts will be clear. In Jesus we pray. Amen.